Welcome to Tony Talks. Welcome to Tony Talks. Welcome How's everybody Tony doing today? This is Attorney Antonio Moore. I want to come to you today to discuss this, uh, the end of the strike and what it means to black writers, in my view, um, black screenwriters, what we're seeing coming out of the media as they discuss this thing and the lack of context. Um, I think for a long time, Hollywood has basically been a reflection of white wealth and also a way for the decadent veil to create calm amongst a general population that's not sharing in that wealth. Part of what has allowed for a large base of particularly black folks that are poor to feel comfortable is that they live through the, the visions of, of ALF or the middle class life of uh, home improvement and as a result, they just don't know their own status in their own homes as they live foot to neck. And as we look at this thing with this writer strike, and we look at what's about to happen as Hollywood reopens, we don't know the details yet of what is in the terms, but if they didn't deal with black folks, and particularly American This Is a Slavery, which I doubt they dealt with, y'all finish. Y'all about to be shut out. And I think in many ways, I have to ask whether you deserve it because of the way your politics move. I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that as I go through this, this video, but I wanna go through this video using this LA Times article kind of frame things and start to have the discussion to ask the question, what does the end of the Hollywood strike really mean for black folks in Hollywood? So we have this article, Striking Black Screenwriter Fear the Job Market Will Shrink. And in it, the writer does a detailed view of what some of the viewpoints are coming out of the writers. I believe that what they're expressing is the political consequence of what we said with reparations as American descendants of slavery, as we pushed that on the New York Times nationally, as we pushed that at a conference with Cornell West. And at that time, I didn't see none of those people in the, in the actual conference. So here's the consequence. You don't get to be a writer in Hollywood, possibly. Unless you fight for yourself, you ain't gonna be for yourself. How about it? So now you wanna say it individually and, and you struggling. This is Hollywood right here. Uh-huh. White men and white women celebrating. Celebrating their success. And, and, and Chris, Chris Rock told us back in 2014 whether he stood there consistently is a whole nother question. But he told us back in 2014, and I'm gonna read this to you before I get into the LA Times article. It's a white industry, it just is, the Hollywood Reporter. We don't have to go anywhere but here to remember this. This is how Hollywood is actually done. At these tables that shut black folks out. You see Jennifer Aniston, you see so many producers here. You see the other woman from uh, Friends on there. Courtney Cox, I believe is her name. Excuse me if I got it wrong. And this is Hollywood. Hollywood is largely, and I'm going to share this with you that I got from Mark Walper, whose dad was David Walper that did Roots. He's on his third generation. In his first iteration, what they did is they took that money from making studio films and they bought the hills. They bought real estate. The real estate that you see in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, no, nah, they bought them hills up. So... It's on his third iteration, and these are the children of that success. So tied in through elite schools, Harvard, Westlake, and the like, locking out black folks. And you think you're gonna come in for an internship, but DEI is finished. So that the method that you were using, the watered down version that you were using of a path is done. And you think that this strike is going to be all right for you. What do I mean? Corporate DEI mentions drop to lowest level since 2018. These are corporations. NBC Universal, Warner Brothers. These are corporations that now, unless this decision or this agreement, I should say, this tentative deal dealt with ADOSness in Hollywood will shut you out. And how will they deal with ADOSness, meaning American descendants of slavery? not just being black in Hollywood, if you the first person to fight with us when we brought it to the table, to tell us, well, well everybody deserve a chance. Okay, well, let's take your chance away. Hmm. So we come back to what Hollywood is. 
and we look at this thing and we look at it through a 2014 interview and particularly a section of that interview where Chris Rock got brutally honest about how they look for Jordan Peele. The black guy with a white mama whose black family wasn't even around like that, went to the elite boarding schools, but he get us, allow us to say that we got black folks in the room. He didn't explicitly say Jordan Peele, nor was he explicitly talking about that individual, but he spoke to that kind of dynamic where they avoid black people by still bringing in black people that are kind of aberrational black people. Come on. It's a white industry, just as the NBA is a black industry. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. It just is. Now, I would push back on the NBA being a black industry when all the whites own all the teams. and um, It just is. And the black people they tend tired tend to be the same person. That person tends to be a female, and that person tends to be Ivy League, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. As a matter of fact, that's what I want for my daughters. But something tells me that the life that my privileged daughters are leading right now might not make them the best candidates to run the black division of anything. We come back to it and we look at this discussion and we ask the question, what will be the consequence of a lack of politics, a lack of ADOS focused politics, meaning politics focused on those people that descend from the slavery here in America to include them in this whole tentative deal on whether you get any any uh, acting roles or writing roles or anything else. I'm going to say it's going to be negative, and negative is an understatement. But you ain't got to take my word for it. They shook already. This is Hollywood right here. All right. It's a deal. WGA and AMTP reached tentative agreement to end writer strike, picketing suspended. So the WGA and then the, the producing studios, Writers Guild, and the, they reached a tentative deal. We don't know the terms yet, but I'm willing to bet that those terms do not include any focus on American descendants of slavery. I don't even think they're going to include real focus on black folks at all either. That's just my view. We'll see. The Writers Guild has reached a tentative agreement with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers to end its strike after nearly five months. The parties finalized the framework of the deal Sunday when they were able to untangle their stalemate over AI and writing room staffing levels. The WGA and AMTP have reached a tentative agreement. The WGA and the AMTP said in a joint statement this evening, I guess they were talking about yesterday, we have reached a tentative agreement on a new 2023 MBA, which is to say an agreement in principle on all deal points subject to drafting final contract language. The WGA told its mem members in a release, which came just after sunset and the start of Yom Kippur. Okay. This is Hollywood. So these folks negotiated for their interests against the studios, and you think they included you. You ain't even at their lunch. America has locked out Black folks in general, but more particularly ADOS folks from America, and we think we about to be the most elite people in the country without doing no politics, tiptoeing around folks, trying to be the only person in the background of the clapping. Come on. Where he at? Where is he at? I think he stood up first. Hold on. There you go. We're going to be the only person in the background of the clapping. So here we are with a world, a white world, a white Hollywood that has negotiated in its own interest. That's a white industry. It just is. And you got black writers allowing black buffoonery Come on, to be the face of them. Look at this man. He just having a good time, Tom. See nothing wrong with it. Okay. Okay. Striking black screenwriters fear the job market will shrink. Let's go through some of this article that this writer put together out of the LA Times. And you can go read the whole article yourself and subscribe to the Times as you see fit. As co-chair of the Writers Guild of America West Committee of Black Writers, Hillard Guest, 
mentors young writers and first-time scribes as they navigate Hollywood. Sometimes I meet these writers out on the picket lines and walk with them and talk them through how to survive, says Guest. And when we come out of this, it's going to be better for them, better than it was for me and all of us coming up. Most white Hollywood writers have a family member or a white writer that saw something in them, but not us. We think we the genius, but let's go. But many of these writers who joined writing staff in 2023 only to have their dreams delayed aren't convinced. They are scared to death about what their futures will look like after the writer's strike. Now, well into its fifth month, Inns guest uh, said uh, leaders from the WGA and the w and the major studios resumed negotiations this week amid signs of progress toward a possible deal. Actors joined them on the picket lines in mid-May. I think a lot of people aren't going to be coming back to the jobs they had before they went. this went down. And the folks that are going to be left out are Black folks at large, and anybody not at this table, which is eight or so. Can we talk? Y'all thought we was talking about reparations and we was talking about your lives. Let me say it again. Y'all thought we was talking about reparations like it was sickle cell and we was talking about your right to actually be in Hollywood. You better learn to stand up for yourself, but I can't have you stand up for yourself if you don't know self. You out here not understanding the importance of being American descendant of slavery. We just black all the same. We struggle the same. Okay. I think a lot of people aren't going to be coming back to the jobs that they had before this went down. That sense of uneasiness is widely shared among black writers. Like most WGA members, many remain supportive of the strike, but they also fear there will be a contraction of projects that will disproportionately affect them once Hollywood gets back to work. Oh, they ain't got to fear it. It's coming. You were already seeing something that felt like a trend within the business, which was some of the diverse projects either not moving forward when they should have or being canceled when they shouldn't have, said Ben Watkins, WGA member and executive producer, writer, and showrunner behind TV series Hands of God and Cross. So these people have been talking about diverse. Black folks coming in the room, talking about diverse as thinking about talking about themselves. Latinos be talking about for Latinos. Indians are talking about Indian projects. Native Americans are pushing for Native Americans, but Adolfs are talking about diverse. There's a track record of when there are disruptions within the industry and the industry starts to figure out who they are again, that writers of color and diversity-driven projects seem to disproportionately suffer, Watkins adds. Even before the strikes begin, Hollywood seemed to be retreating from commitments to diversity, equity, and conclusion as evidenced by the cancellation of diverse shows and the fact that several top-level DEI executives have been unceremoniously laid off at major studios. I come back to the Supreme Court decision around DEI involving schools out of Harvard, and I say to you today that you will bear the consequence of not fighting for being Adolf, let alone Black Americans. Corporate DEI mentions dropped to lowest level since 2018. Did you make them put Adolf into that tentative agreement or not. And I'm willing to bet not. So we're reading this article, we're framing this discussion, striking black screenwriters fear the job market will shrink. They don't got to fear it, it is going to shrink. The, that television broom probably around 2015, 2016 kind of forced the industry to give new showrunners an opportunity. They were uh, younger, more forward thinking, has it created more opportunities for us black writers? A thousand percent, says Jamel Turner, writer and co-executive producer on the CW's All-American. By 2020, African Americans made up 15.5% of all TV series writers. So African Americans, uh, let's be clear, because I, I think that the writer of this article and a lot of even black folks are confused. Nigerian Americans, Haitian Americans, Jamaican Americans are specific categories. They do not go into the category African-American. That is the same as Black American, which is really ADOS. You aren't giving us the number of ADOS writers. You're adding all of those groups into it. And I know that because I've talked to uh, 
uh, people from the Caribbean islands, they are black Americans, what they call us, Ados people. They are, they have a country and a country. So they're a separate category. Unless you have that data, you shouldn't put that data in this article. And that data is to parse out. And I know you don't have it because we haven't asked Hollywood. That's why ADOS, meaning American Descendants of Slavery, the group that I co-founded, the ADOS Foundation, uh, Yvette Carnell, the president of ADOS Foundation, we're pushing the Office of Management and Budget to include separate categories for Black folks because it's far, it needs to be disaggregated. Because what you're getting is numbers that don't reflect. Because I, I bet you that we're not nothing but like, we're, we're 40 million, 40 something million of the, of the 48 million Blacks. But well, we might not be but 6% of this 15.5 or 7%, meaning eight off folks. Many of these gains were driven by that ex TV expansion, the hiring of diversity executives and a certain mindset toward inclusion. This expansion, though, also helped create the seeds of the current conflict as writers felt shortchanged by the streaming boom. I think everyone has agreed there was too much TV being made, and that, and that was all done in the name of more subscribers, says Malcolm Spellman, writer and creator on The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Bel Air, and, and co-producer on Empire. Spellman is also the writer of Marvel Studios' coming, upcoming Captain America Brave New World. He's seen how an abundance of writers in the film ecosystem limits opportunity for the writers of color when the business contracts and fears that TV uh, is on the same path. You don't have to fear it. Rashid Newsom. An executive producer and co-developer of Bel Air adds that studios have been asking productions to get by with fewer writers. They're essentially saying to us, you had a writing staff of 10, couldn't you get by with four, he says. Everything at this point is so efficient. Everything's been cut to so many bare bones that the only thing left to squeeze are people. Talisha Rags, writer and co-producer on The Equalizer in NCIS New Orleans, was one of those who felt the squeeze. She struggled after uh, the 07 strike, not working for almost three seasons and understands the hardship a work stoppage can bring. The many rooms are one obstacle for everyone, but with new black writers, she says, there are even more barriers to getting good writing jobs. My main fear for younger writers coming up when they're already being squeezed by a scarcity of jobs is the many rooms. People are going to try to make their seasons so locking out younger writers has the potential to happen to a greater degree once everyone comes back, you know how you don't get locked out your mama and daddy in Hollywood and they make phone calls, but we don't be having that. You know, you don't get locked out policy, reparative justice type policy that says you have to have a quota of ADOS, black Americans in that room. That's how you don't, get, you know how you get locked out talking about diversity and inclusion. Or for that matter, allowing them to not talk about it at all in the political environment where it's being struck down by the Supreme Court in the idea that it's all going to work out for you because you don't want to rock the boat. Corporate DEI mentions dropped to lowest level since 2018. We are in a nation and at a time where, forget just Black folks, diversity as a whole is being shut out and you better get in through that front door the parents and that wealth and that privilege and if you can't come through that door like ados black folks likely largely almost all can't you out can we talk today can i get back to let's talk about it striking black screenwriters fear the job market will shrink I want to talk about it. Did workplace DEI programs die following the Supreme Court's affirmative action decision? Question mark. Talking about the Harvard decision on DEI. I told y'all that that was going to spread to corporations, and it has because of fear of having the same litigation brought up against them with a highly conservative Supreme Court. And here we are. It's been nearly two months since the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action in college admissions. And many employers are still wondering whether the workplace DEI programs are still legal in the wake of the groundbreaking rule. While the dust is still settling, the answer to this question is starting to come into focus. Here's a review of how the SCOTUS decision impacted workplace DEI programs and six steps you could take to ensure compliance. Did Supreme Court ruling impact corporate DEI programs? On June 29th, the Supreme Court ruled that UNC and Harvard's use of race in their college admission decisions 
violated the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment. The court held that white student body diversity is a commendable goal, the school's approach, which had no ability to determine when student body diversity reached acceptable levels amounted to stereotyping. Again, we come back to ADOS. We told you guys that the only way this program worked is if it was focused on ADOS, not just blacks in general or diversity at large, focused on repairing a harm done to a specific group in a specific line of families. Ain't nothing xenophobic about it. Ain't nothing crazy about it. It's just basic legal reasoning. So now what happens is they done gutted it not only for schools, but it's also for corporations. And so you think you still going to be in that room and you ain't got no phone calls from your mama and you ain't got no policy for you and you don't know what's coming. You might as well go on there and pack it in now. Because you ain't going to write no boat yourself. You're not going to tell nobody nothing. The court held that while student body diversity is a commendable goal, the school's approach, which had no ability to determine when student body diversity reached acceptable levels, amounted to stereotyping. Employer diversity, and inclusion, equity, and inclusion programs and federal contractor affirmative action practices were not directly addressed by the court's decision. Still, many employers and interest groups have been focused on what the SCOTUS decision means for employers and their DEI programs. And that's why when this tentative deal comes out, if it does not mention Black folks, you guys have failed. You had to address this because of the Supreme Court decision, or you just deal with it when you get fired. Because it's it's it's, it's prescient. It's it's I mean, you can't allow to be you're not see a lot of you guys built your corporate identity as neutral and you got by because DEI was in place. Well, DEI is actually now a negative impact because of this possibility of litigation. So you had to make them and force them in the negotiation to address you, you individually, not diversity. And the best way to do that was to make them focus on you being ADOS, you being American descendant of slavery and you being shut out of Hollywood. And you had to do the work. You had to show that it would actually get a documentation and proving that these studios were shutting out ADOS families that were here well before mass immigration. You had to do that work. And I, I don't think any of you guys did that. You just got your fingers crossed. But they got six steps for the employers with DEI programs. Review your recruiting. Efforts to expand the applicant pool should remain acceptable. You should continue outreach to diverse sources for applicants, including high schools and diverse communities, HBCUs, and organizations that promote women, minorities, veterans, disabled individuals, and other underrepresented groups. Avoid improper and illegal considerations when hiring and promoting. That's what happens when you don't do no politics at the federal level. Just as before the Supreme Court's decision, private employers are prohibited from using race and other protected char characteristics when making employment decisions such as hiring and promotions. Avoid doing so now, just as then. Reconsider race-based goals. Quotas have been unlawful for private employers under Title uh, VII. It's likely that race-based objectives would also be as problematic after the SCOTUS decision. Provide DEI training, but make sure it stays in bounds. DEI training initiatives remain a beneficial aspect of your development plans, but you should review them to ensure the content is legally appropriate. Focus on the benefits of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Retain, but consider retooling. Mentoring programs. Existing mentoring programs that promote career development are generally legal, and you should continue them to enhance your company's development efforts. However, programs should be open to all employees, regardless of race or other protected categories. Open your employee resource groups. These groups, sometimes known as business or affinity groups, remain legal just as they were before the SCOTUS decision. But you should review membership guidelines. They have omitted your blackness. And your doorway in for many of y'all was being black, but through diversity and being neutral. So you're going to not say nothing, but you're going to be the black person and clapping. And now you got a problem. A lot of y'all are going to come back to no jobs. In many cases, it's going to be no careers at all. Can we talk? And I'm just preparing you for why. Y'all were holding up the signs, but the signs didn't say Adolf. They didn't say Black American. The signs said, get these white folks back a job. And you didn't even know it. They knew it at the dinner table, though. Want to talk about it. How about it? I just wanted to come to you today and have a discussion because we out here, we dancing 
for the cameras, but we don't understand the truth of it all. And Chris Rock told us back in 2014, we knew it well before then. It's a white industry, it just is. Again, striking black writers fear the job market will shrink. Striking black screenwriters fear the job market will shrink. Huh. Maybe they should do more than fear it. They should prepare for it. This is Tom Talks. Please go to TomTalks.net, subscribe, donate, or share this video. It's time to have this discussion because nobody else is having it this way right now. Thank you.